Our Father which art in heaven, the everlasting God, we come to you now humbly asking for guidance and direction that the presentation would be free from pride and human devising and that you would give the gift of speech, articulation and also understanding that we can receive the clear communications that come from heaven. I pray that the message would be clear, pointed, and edifying, and that Jesus and him alone would be the very center and focus. Bless our worship, bless our study. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray and thank you. Amen. Two things very quickly, and this comes from conversation I had with some brethren right after the Sabbath school. There is there is uh, recorded statements, Sister White. There was a statement I showed, and she mentioned brothers H, I, and J, and. Uh, Brother H, I know for certain she's referring to Brother Haskell during that controversy with, you had Prescott and Daniels presenting this sanctuary view of the daily. On the other side, you had some of the older men, the leading men in the work like Haskell, who was upholding the pioneer view of the daily. She was telling both sides that silence was eloquence at that time. So it was both sides she was telling, do not agitate the question of the daily, so that we present a fair presentation, and I appreciate that that was brought to me, and I have read, I did not include that, and uh, if, the state, if the presentation seems a little one-sided, it was not intended, it is only to bring light to the controversy and where it originated. Uh, that doesn't mean that there were uh, some of the pioneer men in the movement upholding the original view uh, of the daily that was given to, to the Advent pioneers. And Sister White was admonishing both sides at that time that they should remain silent. Once again, it was for the sake of pressing together. And you notice in all of those statements that she qualified them as having pertained to that period of time. There was was not a time where she didn't say in any of those statements, she says, never bring up the daily. It's unimportant. It's it's, it's a mute point. It's, 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 It's not a test or salvation or question. And at any time should we ever discuss it she always qualified it in the sense and in the context of we don't need another controversy in our midst at this present time. The reason why it has become a question now is because the third angel's message as it is presented in Daniel eleven forty 40 to 45, we are directly told that we are to reference verses 30 to 36. That's 13th. I don't have that in my presentation but you can write it down and it's on record. It's Manuscript Releases, Volume 13, page 394. Sister White, she refers, she says, the prophecy of of Daniel 11 is almost complete. Similar scenes will take place that took place in verses 30 to 36. And she says, in order to rightly divide, if you'll read it, if you'll see it, in order to rightly divide the final verses of Daniel 11, you have to refer to 30 to 36 because she says those, that that history will repeat. And the history that took place there was the daily being taken away. And I want to address that in a moment, what taking away of the daily actually means. But in verse 31, you see pagan Rome giving its power seat and great authority to papal Rome. That's part of the history that we are told in order to rightly understand Daniel eleven forty to 45, which I believe, teach, and understand to be the present truth message of the hour. If it was a prophecy in Daniel that caused the revival and reformation of the Great Advent Movement in 1840 to 45, and if that history is repeating again to the very letter, as we are told in many places by inspiration that it will repeat, then that means that it's, there's going to be a prophetic message coming from the book of Daniel that will cause the final revival and reformation. The taking away of the daily. I want us to turn to Daniel Chapter 8, because the brother said, paganism has never really been taken away. No, paganism will exist to the end of time. 
what, the, what pagan Rome did was lift up and exalt the papacy. And the opposition of paganism, represented by those kingdoms of Bible prophecy, had at that point been removed by 508. If we look to our charts, we see on both charts, this chart that Sister White says in 1842 was, was when it was originated, and that this 1843 chart, as it, is, as it is referred to, was directed by the hand of the Lord. She refers also in inspiration to this chart that was published by Brother Nichols. She says that I saw that God was in the publishment of this chart, and there is a prophecy of it in the Bible. And on both of these charts, if you can come up and see personally yourself, on the 1843, right there in big, bold numbers is the year 508. And underneath it says, taking away of the daily sacrifice. And it refers us to the book of Daniel. On the 1850 chart, you will see the daily taken away, Daniel 11, 31. And it has the year 508. So these charts uphold the pioneer view of the daily. The opposition from paganism ceased by 508. And there was a 30-year period where now the abomination of desolation was going to be set up, which is the papal power. So paganism was not taken away in its fullest sense. The pagan opposition coming from the ten divisions of the Roman power had now ceased. So that's a, hopefully a clarification on that. And it, 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 that is shown to us in the Bible, in the Hebrew language, Daniel 8 and verse 11, it says, Yea, he magnified himself. Remember, in Daniel 8, and I saw your hand, brother. In Daniel 8, the little horn represents pagan and papal Rome. And you have to study it out, and you'll see that it goes from papal Rome in verse 10 to pagan Rome in verse 11 to papal Rome in verse 12. And we, we see that. John Peters, you could read his book, The Mystery of the Daily. He deals with the... Ma masculine and femininity of the usage of the, of the, of the wording. And we'll show you it refers to pagan and papal Rome. But notice in verse 11 when it's referring to pagan Rome, because pagan Rome was the one who magnified himself to the prince of the host, Christ. It was the pagan Roman power. Herod was a Roman representative. Pilate was the governor or the Roman representative. It was the centurion that pierced his side. I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was the, the Italian band. It was the, the, the Roman soldiers that put the uh, scarlet uh, or, or purple robe and crown of thorns and smote him on the head. It, it was the Roman power that crucified Christ and magnified the pagan Rome to the prince of the host. And it says, by him the daily sacrifice or the daily paganism was taken away. In the original language... Notice that the daily is taken away there, okay? The daily is taken away in Daniel eleven thirty one, and the daily is taken away in Daniel twelve eleven. Three times we see it taken away, but in Daniel eight eleven, the words for the original Hebrew word for taken away is different than the other two instances. In Daniel eight eleven, the word for taken away can also be interpreted as lift up and exalt. So when 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 pagan Rome, Clovis being the, you know, the, 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 the uh, Catholic Church uh, acknowledges that history that they call France the first daughter of the church. They call Clovis the first son of the church, the most Christian uh, prince, something to that effect. He had these titles bestowed upon him. You can read them in Smith's book. Because they acknowledge that that when he started that, that it began this trend of, remember, Rome was divided into ten. Okay, pagan Rome was divided into ten. The, the, the legs of iron were divided into ten. We see that represented in Daniel 7, um, when that beast had ten horns on it. Pagan Rome was divided into ten. We see it represented here, ten divisions of the kingdom of Rome. And we know that by 508, the opposition from those pagan kingdoms ceased. And now the papacy simply had to remove the Aryan element, which was the Ostrogoths, Vandals, and Heruli, by 538, when the king of the Ostrogoths was removed. So paganism, really, pa pa the papacy lifts up and exalts paganism to new heights, because now, as you put it, it put church clothes on. Okay? So I want to address those two, and now I want us to get into this particular study. Amen? Your hand, brother. Yeah, 
share with other customers um, is really interested in doing it with themselves. I have a sister staying in Richmond. She asked me, why do you have two parts for the Mormon Advent? In fact, it's called Advent in the Cult. Mm -hmm. But I haven't been speaking in a few days. I've just been living things and welcoming them into my home. Yeah. And she finally started asking some questions. And she said, what is this? Why do you have two here? Because they look kind of similar. And I'm developing uh, this relationship where I'm sharing with her. The issue is, the first chart deals with righteous judgment. The judgment hour message as Daniel saw it, as opposed to the enemies of Israel, paganism and papacy. The second chart deals with righteous judgment as moreover John started seeing it in Revelation, dealing with Israel's modern enemies and the deadly wound being in Hagel. That paganism that takes over the United Nations and that papacy that will seat on its throne when the deadly wound is healed. So I'm sharing with her it's righteous judgment. Righteous the daily judgment. deals with God's enemies and God and his righteous judgment. Amen. But I you know I wouldn't just share that normally to interrupt up my hand. I would just say you can pass on it. But because it was so personal this morning that these things came up this morning as a witness to someone in my home. When we see in the bigger picture there's a flood of light coming through through these right. Not just the daily, but righteous judgment to the glory of God. Amen. You know, and it's, it's just, it was beautiful. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen. Amen church. Amen. 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 Let's deal with the Bible. Let's make the Bible argument. But before we do, I want to ask us, and it's right along the theme of what we're talking about. And I, I, I'm, I'm asking for answers. Are we standing on the foundation? Before you answer that question, and some might know where I'm going with this. What are the foundations of Adventism? Let's name them. Let's the Sabbath. Sabbath. Okay. State, of the State of the dead. Righteousness, Righteousness by faith. Sanctuary. Sanctuary. Judgment. Judgment. Health message. Health message. Any others? State of the dead. We got that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Here's what I want to, and I'm, I'm making a point with this. Let me ask you this. Let's name some of these. When, when, did, when did Sister White get the vision of the health message? Anyone know that? 1863, right? Okay. When did the message of righteousness by faith, which, 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 faith, which was not a no new message, it's, 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 it's the message of the gospel, but when did it come to the church? 1888. Okay, so we have 1863, 1888. When did they understand the sanctuary for what it really was? When did they begin to understand that? 1844. It was 1844, but it was prior to the Great Disappointment. It was after, pardon me, the Great Disappointment. Matter, we can mark Edson's walk through the cornfield on the day after the disappointment. But it was, nonetheless, it was post-1844 disappointment, right? Uh, so that's sanctuary. When did, they get, when did the Sabbath truth come to the, the ad? The Adventist believe it was after the disappointment, isn't that right? So, so now we said those are foundations. I said, what's the foundation? And we named some of these things. Now, judgment is correct. It's one of the, it's one of the foundations. We see that represented by the twenty three hundred day prophecy. Um, State of the dead was presented, I believe, prior to the eighteen forty four disappointment. However. When we consider what the foundations are, now, when we look at the structure, and last night we started here as well, we said that even before a foundation is laid, the ground is graded, and it's made sure that it's, it's, it's solid, firm, and level. Yeah. We saw that, according to the statement from Sister White, that it's the more sure word of prophecy that is the ground of Adventism, and that is also the foundation of Adventism. She said it's the, that the 2300 days is the foundation and central pillar. So she... Now, the, you, do you see the erection of the structure? So it springs from the ground, foundation, central pillar, cross beams, uh, trusses, walls, windows, roof. You, you pile that on, right? When we start naming these doctrines, uh, we, I don't know if we mentioned it, but, you know, spirit of prophecy, a true prophet. We know that Ellen White did not enter into a prophetic office until after the disappointment as well. Many of these, like the, 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 the sanctuary, health message, righteousness by faith, the Sabbath, they, did, they were not part of that foundational message. It's true, right? We are told and given reference for when the foundations came in. The warning has come. 
Nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we have been building ever since the message came in 1842, 43, and 44. Those are the years where the foundations of Adventism were laid. Now, Miller was preaching since 1831, receives endorsement and license in 1833. The first angel's message was empowered on August 11th, 1840. Yet, Sister White, did she err in saying 1842? Let's keep reading the statement, and then we'll show you why I believe she says 1842. Nothing is to be allowed that will come in that will disturb the foundation, pardon me, of the faith upon which we've been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. I was in this message, and ever since I have been standing before the world true to the light that God has given us, we do not propose to take our feet off the platform. So the foundations and platform are synonymous in inspiration, on which they were placed as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer seeking for light, do you think that I could give up the light that God has given me? It is to be as the rock of ages. It has been guiding me ever since it was given. Amen. The foundations came. Why 1842? As early as 1842, the direction given in this prophecy to write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it had suggested to Charles Fitch the preparation of a prophetic chart to illustrate the visions of Daniel and the revelation, the publication of this chart was regarded as a fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. When they started preaching that message from that chart, she said the foundations were established. Mm -hmm. And the foundations were established between 1842 and 1844. Those other that we mentioned, uh, the health message, they came after. They're, we can consider those pillars mm -hmm. of Adventism. Yeah. But foundations are represented on the chart. Do we understand the difference? The foundations are on the chart. And we have to have, if you start putting up those, those pillars without a foundation, it's not going to stand very long. Okay? So we are directed back to the foundations. We are told in Isaiah 58, verse 12, we know what it says, right? We are to build up the what? Old or new waste places? Old waste places, right? We are to raise up the foundations of what? Many generations. We are to be the repairs of the breach and the restorers of the paths to dwell in. And we know that Jeremiah clarifies which paths. They are the old paths of Adventism. We are told to walk therein and we will find rest for our souls. The same thing Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. He says, if you come to me, I'll give you rest. How do you come to Jesus? By walking in the old path. Amen. Did you get it? Amen. Amen. You walk in the old path. There's no new thing under the sun. What's God going to give us? A, a new message at the end of time? No, he's going to refer us back. God requireth that which is past. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 41. Turn with me there. Let's go in our Bibles. Now we're going to give some biblical arguments. Isaiah 41. The Bible says God is love, right? God is love, right? The Sabbath teaches us that the true God is the living God, the God of creation. God is the creator. But I, I want to show you some texts here in Isaiah that show us that God is the God of prophecy. One thing that sets the true God apart from other false gods is the, the fact that he can tell things that come in the future. And his, his pattern... For future events are past events. He doesn't do anything. He is, God doesn't change his method. The, James said there is no variableness or shadow of turning in God. So he says, look, I'm not going to change my method. If I change my I'm going to keep operating the, in the same fashion. And as you look to the past, you will see that those types of those experiences of, the, of, 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 of God's people in ages past, they are simply written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 41, beginning in verse 21. God is giving a challenge. You, you'll have to read it yourself in context. God is, 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 is giving a challenge 
to all the false gods. And he says, produce your cause. We're in Isaiah 41, 21. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. That's future, right? That's prophecy, right? So let these false gods, let them show us what shall happen. Now, let them show the what? Former things, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them. So as we study the former things, we will then know what the latter end of things will be. And God is directing us back to the foundations of Adventism. In Hebrews, the Bible says that Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. The faith that we are founded upon is the faith that came in 1842, 43, 44. So if Jesus authored that, and God declares the end from the beginning, if he's the Alpha and the Omega, if he never varies or changes then as he started Adventism by raising up this prophetic revival and reformation, there's no revival without reformation, then he's going to use the same methods at the end of time. All right. Let's keep going. The daily. In the original language, the word is to me. Okay? It means con continuity, perpetuity, to stretch continually, continuously as an adverb, continuity. Okay? Continuity puts it in a noun form. However, we do not see it used as a noun form at any place in the Bible except in Daniel. So the true definition of tamid is continually, continuously, or every day, daily. So far, so good? Everywhere else in the Bible, it's either used as an adjective or an adverb. And we're going to give you plenty of text right now to prove that, okay? One thing, when the translators of the King James Bible attached a word to it, they didn't just pull a word out of the sky. They had based it on analogy of Scripture. And they had gone to the prior text in the Old Testament, and they said, every time we see the word tamid used, it's always attached to the sanctuary service. And because they couldn't understand that Daniel was not using it to modify another word. You understand what I mean by a modifying word? So if I say, uh, this is a book. book is a, person, a noun is a person, place, or thing. So this noun, this book, okay? But now I'm going to modify the noun by saying, it's a red book. So now red has become my adjective, and it's describing the noun. It's a modifier. We're going to English class today. Amen? Amen. Yeah. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. Amen. We learn some math and some science and some English. Amen. That's why the Bible is the best textbook. Amen. Amen. So we have a modifying word. Now, so let, let's, let's just get the, the definition. Let me, I don't want to get ahead of myself. This is Webster's 1828 Dictionary. They've now attached it to the Ellen White CD-ROM. You could use it. At your, they're selling that thing for $20. Amen. And they've attached all the pioneer writings to it. Yes. And they've attached the 1828 dictionary to it. And they've attached all the Gibbons, the, the rise and fall of the Roman. Uh, you know, she always quotes that in Great Controversy. And Smith quotes it. They got, it's all on the CD-ROM now. And they're giving it away. Do you think God's trying to wake up his people? Amen. He's trying to say, this is the message. I'm pointing you back to the old. We have no new message. We are to proclaim the same message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. An adjective is, in grammar, a word used with a noun to express a quality of the thing named or something attributed to it or to limit or define it or to specify or describe a thing as distinct from something else. It is called also an attributive or attribute. Thus, in the phrase, a wise ruler, wise is the adjective or attribute expressing a particular property of the ruler. Simple, right? An adverb describes a verb. So if you say, you know, I took my morning walk. But if you say, as I took, uh, I walked to church. But if you say, I walked briskly to church, you've now described the verb. The verb was walk, right? But now you've modified the verb by t expressing how you walked. That's an adverb, okay? In grammar, a word used to modify the sense of a verb. 
participle, adjective, or attribute, and usually placed near it as he writes well. He writes is the verb, but he writes well is the adverb. Well is the adverb. Paper extremely white. So it's paper, but now it's extremely white. That modifies the paper. This part of speech might be more significantly named a modifier, as it, its use is to modify, that is to vary or qualify the sense of another word. Makes sense, right? By enlarging or restraining it, restraining it, pardon me, or by expressing form, quality, or manner, which the word itself does not express. The term adverb denoting position merely is often improper. Now, before we go back to that quotation that we've seen, let's, let's notice that in the, in the Old Testament, to mead is always used as either, either an adjective or an adverb. Everybody with me? Let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. Notice, and so notice, note, two things I want you to notice about the word tamid, the word that Daniel used for daily. I want you to notice two things about it. It's always in the Old Testament, other than the book of Daniel, in these examples we're going to show you about five, that it's always used as a modifying word. It's an adjective or an adverb. And it is also linked to something with the sanctuary service. Exodus 25 and verse 30 says, And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me. How? Always. So to set it is the verb. Notice that there's a verb there. To set the, to set the what? The showbread. Does the show, is the showbread a part of the sanctuary? Yes. Is it used as a modifying word here? It says, do it always. That's tamid. The word always in that text is tamid. Same word Daniel used as daily. Okay? I'm just scanning the crowd. I want to make sure everybody's... You know what we do sometimes. We'll see something in the text that... Sometimes we don't know what, what, what all is in the text. I do it all the time. And the, and the minister's speaking, and he's trying to bring out only one point or two points of the text, but I'm, my mind's stuck on the other point of the text. <laughs> so I'm trying to get you to see that we're making a point here, that daily tamid is always associated with the sanctuary, and it is always, with the exception of the book of Daniel, used as a modifying word, adjective or adverb. All right. Chapter 26. I'm sorry, chapter 27. It's all throughout, but these are just ones that I remember at this point. Exodus 27 and verse 20. Let's see if, if, if my argument holds true. Modifying word, sanctuary. Modifying word, associated with the sanctuary. Exodus 27 and verse 20 says, And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn. How? Always. So always is modifying the way the lamp burns. Is the lamp associated with the sanctuary? Yes. Amen. Exodus 29. Exodus 29, verse 42. Exodus 29, verse 42. This shall be a continual burnt offering. We've seen it adverbs twice now we're seeing it as an adjective because it is describing the burnt offering this shall be a what kind of burnt offering continual is the burnt offering associated with the sanctuary yes, yes. we've seen the lamb we've seen the showbread we've seen the burnt offering sanctuary language modifying word adjective or adverb let's give you one more Chapter 30 and verse 8, right there in Exodus, chapter 30 and verse 8. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it. A What kind of incense? Perpetual. The word perpetual, same word Daniel used for daily. It's the word tamid. But is the incense a part of the sanctuary service? Yes, it is. Is perpetual describing the incense? Yes. yes. Modifying word associated with the sanctuary. Numbers. I'll give you one more. I'm going to show you where it's used as the word daily. 
in the Old Testament, but not the way Daniel used it as David. Numbers chapter 4. Numbers chapter 4 and verse 16. Numbers chapter 4 and verse 16. This is, I'm going somewhere with this, so don't think I'm just trying to, that I'm not going somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere with this. Okay, so Numbers 4 and verse 16. And to the office of Eliezer. Now, Eliezer is the son of Aaron. Who is Aaron? So are we dealing with the sanctuary friends? And the office of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the high priest, pertaineth the oil for the light, the sweet incense, and the, what does that say? Daily, Daily what? Meat yeah. offering. Is there, was there a meat offering to be given at the sanctuary? Yeah. Absolutely. Is the word tamid, is it daily? Is it used as an adjective here? Yes, it's describing the meat offering. It's a modifier. Now, I want to just bring this quotation back. We saw this in our first presentation. If, if anyone says, see, Sister White says, silence is eloquent. Uh, I have no light out of manuscript 20. She said, I have no light as to the, the proposed view. And you have to understand what she's saying. I have no light as to the proposed view that Prescott and Daniels are bringing. God has never given me light on to, as to whether the prince and the host and, and, and whether or not this daily is the sanctuary ministry. But she has made a statement on the contrary, which says that the men who gave the judgment hour cry had the correct view of the daily. And it's early writing 74, 75. So let's look at what the man who gave the judgment hour cry believed was the daily, because we have been told by inspiration that that is the correct view. Amen? Amen. All right. William Miller, and here's why we've just qualified this as, as how the word is used in the Old Testament. Because notice what Miller says about it in the book of Daniel. He said, I read on and could find no other case in which it, the daily, was found but in Daniel. We've just seen that that word is over a hundred times. Well, we saw five examples, but if you search for it, it's over a hundred times in the Old Testament. What is Miller saying? He said, I never saw that word anywhere else in the Bible. But it's a hundred times in the Bible. Five times it's in Daniel. What he is saying is, I've never seen it used the way Daniel used it. I then, by the aid of a concordance, took those words which stood in connection with it, take away. He shall take away the daily from the time that the daily shall be taken away. I read on and I thought I would find no light on the text. Finally, I came to 2 Thessalonians. We went there this morning. John Peter said that it was a part of the Advent theology until 1900. That they connected the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians with the daily and the, the taking away of the daily and the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now leadeth will lead until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. And when I had come to that text, oh, how clear and glorious the truth appeared. There it is. That is the daily. Well, now, what does Paul mean by he who now letteth or hindereth, or as we saw earlier, restraineth? By the man of sin. Let's get everyone's attention over here. We'll be all right. By the man of sin and the wicked, popery is meant. Well, what is it that hinders popery from being revealed? Or historically, what hindered the papacy? Which entities? What was... What was what, what power was Satan using to tread down the truth and the gospel before the papacy came to prominence? Paganism. paganism. Mm -hmm. Well, then the daily must mean paganism. Mm -hmm. Josiah Litch. Josiah Litch. These, these are pioneers of Advent movement. Millerites. Okay? The daily sacrifice is the present reading of the English text, but no such thing as sacrifice is found in the original. This is, an acknowledged, this is acknowledged on all hands. It is a gloss or construction put on by the translators. The true reading is the daily and the transgression of desolation. Daily and transgression being connected together by the word and. Man, that's so simple, isn't it? I said me and my wife. Oh, we're now connected, right? The Bible says we're one flesh. But now the logic is the daily is, on, is one, in a sense, with the 
transgression or desolation, uh, abomination of desolation, pardon me. The daily and the transgression of desolation, daily and transgression being connected together by and The daily desolation and the transgression of desolation. They are how many desolating powers? Two. Two. But the modern theology says one of those powers that the daily is heavenly. We have a problem. We have a dilemma. The modern theology says, oh, the daily sacrifice refers to Christ's heavenly sanctuary. Is Christ's heavenly sanctuary a desolating power, friend? It's just the opposite. Which were to desolate the sanctuary and host, the church and her metropolis, they are paganism and popery, as will be shown at large in another place. So what did he say the daily and the abomination of desolation are? There are two desolating powers, and then he names them respectively in their order. He calls them paganism and popery, both under Rome. James White, the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation represent Rome and its pagan and papal... Are we getting it? Am I, am, I, am I beating a dead horse? Too much redundancy? Because she said the men who gave the judgment are a crime. If we find in, uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every matter be established. If the men, let's, who are the men who gave the judgment are a crime? Miller, Litch, White? What have these three men said so far? Paganism is the daily. The daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation represent Rome in its pagan and papal form. You know why there's a divergent view? And you know why people can publish books that stray totally? Because they're not standing on the platform. They're not on the foundation. Oh, brother, we all, you know, we're not getting along and there's no love between us and we're all supposed to preach the third angel's message. Brother, we're not on the foundation. The foundation is Christ. And Christ manifested himself to the world through the Advent message. Huh. These are two desolating powers. Not a good one and a bad one. Both powers of Satan. John Andrews. Now, Andrews was a young man during the 1840s. But nevertheless, he's a pioneer of Seventh-day Adventism. And his parents were Millerites. Because some... I've received some flack. Say, stop calling Uriah Smith a pioneer. He was only 12. He's a pioneer Amen. of Adventism. Amen. He was, he's a pioneer of Sabbatarian, seven-day Adventism. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, a pioneer of, of, the, of, the, of the movement. All right? But let's just make sure we're clear. Okay? Andrews was also around the same age at that time. Nevertheless, we know that Andrews is a pioneer. Go to the Ellen White CD-ROM and click on Words of the Pioneers, and he's one of the authors. So he's classified as a pioneer. We're just making some, some clarification. It needs no argument to prove that the two grand forms of opposition by which Satan has desolated the church and trod underfoot the sanctuary of the living God are none other than paganism and popery. Same thing over and over. Stephen Haskell. Stephen Haskell was also a young man uh, during the 1840 to 44 movement. Paganism, the daily of Daniel 8, 12. Do we see it? Rome became nominally a Christian empire. Her emperor professed the name of Christ and carried before his army the banner of the cross. This is, he's talking about the story of Clovis, who was baptized in 496, right? Oh, no, I, I believe he's talking about Clovis, uh, Constantine at that time. But there's history with Clovis, the leader of the Franks, that Rome acknowledges to this very day. The last contest with paganism was in what year? 508. 508 on this chart, 508 on that chart. Directed by the hand of the Lord. God was in the, in the publishment. Jesus gave us these charts. He wants to direct us back to the old past. These are the foundations. Okay? And on these foundational charts, 508 is represented on both. No change was made. Just how Islam in Bible prophecy is represented on both. Yet today we have, an ad, we have a divergent view on what Islam represents in Bible prophecy. And we believe the Jesuit report of Islam, but we don't believe the Millerite view of Islam. You didn't hear that. You didn't get that. We believe that Alberto Rivera, because Alberto Rivera said that Islam is, 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 is an arm of the papacy, that, 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 that Islam is just a tool of, of Rome. But if you read this book, the Sister White said it's God's helping hand, it says that the false religion of Islam was a scourge to an apostate church. Mm 
Catholicism. That's a directly different view. Is it, is it either for or against Rome? The pioneer said that it was a false religion that was, in a scourge, that was a scourge to Catholicism. Nevertheless, I don't want to veer off track. So paganism. The last contest with paganism was in 508 when the Britons accepted Christianity. The daily spoken of in Daniel had been taken away. By 538, the way was clear for the papacy to sit enthroned on, on the, in, in Rome. This is, these are all, all referenced. There's Haskell. Story of Daniel the Prophet, 72, and page 147. Smith, from these evidences, we think it clear that the daily or paganism was taken away in A.D. 508. This was preparatory to the setting up or the establishment of the papacy, which was a separate and subsequent event. He had to receive the power, seat, and great authority, but also three horns had to be plucked up. God said so. Okay? And they shall place the abomination and make it desolate. Having shown quite fully what constituted the taking away of the daily or paganism, we now inquire, when was the abomination that make it desolate or papacy placed or set up? The little horn that had eyes like the eyes of a man was not slow to see when the way was open for his advancement and elevation. From the year 508, his progress, progress toward universal supremacy was without a parallel. Okay? We forget that Ellen White was a pioneer, too. We forget that. We forget that. Notice what she says, Great Controversy 54. In the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. 6th century, right? 6th century is the 500s. Yeah. When was the papacy established on the throne of the earth? 538. <laughs> so she's referring us to 538. In the 6th century, she's referring to 538. The papacy had become firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city, and the bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. Paganism, the daily, had given place to the papacy, the abomination of desolation. It's right there. The dragon had given to the beast his power, his seat, and great authority. The seat of the city of Rome, the power of military and economic support, and also the great authority to rule given by Justinian. And now began the 1260 years of papal oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation. You know, I'm just impressed to stop right now, and I wish we had time to go over what we went over last night. Because last night we showed, when Christ was baptized, go to Mark chapter 1. Go to Mark, the first chapter. Because I just have the feeling, I'm just impressed. I, I, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's me, maybe I'm reading into it. But I have the impression that some are probably questioning, well, where's Christ in all of this? Right? Just give me Jesus. I want to hear the gospel. We saw at least five statements last night that say the third angel's message is the gospel. Amen. That you cannot subtract the first angel who proclaims the everlasting gospel from the second or the third. Amen. There's no buffet in Revelation 14. Mark chapter 1, notice what it says here in verse number 14. Now after John, Mark 1 and 14, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came unto Galilee preaching the what? The gospel of the kingdom of God. So what was Jesus preaching? The gospel. What was he a personification of? The gospel. He was the gospel in the flesh. And now notice what his pre preaching of the gospel of the kingdom was. He says in verse 15 and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So the burden of Christ's preaching was prophecy. Amen. He, pointed, he pointed his followers back to the 70 weeks of Daniel. Amen. Chapter 9. Mm -hmm. He said, I am the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It was a false interpretation of Bible prophecy that caused the Jews to sacrifice their Messiah. It will be a false representation, or could it be that if we're not careful on how we deal with prophecy at the end of time, that we might just end up being guilty of the same. Here's another quote. Sign of the time. I think, I think it's... But now we're going to show you some of the subtleties of the dragon. Okay? Because the drag paganism is the dragon power. At the end of time, God's people have a threefold enemy. It is described as a sister white says it this way in Great Controversy, page 588, and in volume five of the testimonies, page 451. 
she says the same thing. She says that under the threefold union, God's people are going to come under the dragon's ire. This is just a paraphrase. You read the statement. But she does say this. She says that it will be apostate Protestantism, spiritualism, mm -hmm. and Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Spiritualism can be, is everything all right? Spiritualism is just another term for paganism, heathenism, dragon. The dragon represents paganism, spiritualism. It represents uh, 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 the kingly authority in the world. Is everyone with me? Amen. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are asking that you would help filter out all distractions. I pray that those who are here would see the, vi the value and the validity of what is being presented, not so that we can prove how smart we are or how well we remember the Bible and memorize scripture or how well we can use our computer to find quotes on the Ellen White CD. But I pray that we would be impressed with the character that one needs to develop in order that we might enter into the eternal kingdom that you have prepared for us. And we are told that our character will be developed by studying the books of Daniel and Revelation. You're very clear in inspiration. And so as we study this foundational truth, I pray that our hearts would be stirred, that our minds would be attentive, and that every distraction will cease. And even if there are distractions, that we would spend uh, effort in focusing on your word. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. 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 Through, through paganism and then through the papacy. Do you see the order? Yes. You see the order? You go to Daniel 2, you see the order. You go to Daniel 7, you see the order. You go to Daniel 8, you see the order. You go to Daniel 11, you see the order. Paganism, then papacy. Papacy is the masterpiece. Here at Great Controversy, page 50. Mm -hmm. Paganism is the masterpiece of the devil. That's a serious statement. Through paganism, then through the papacy, Satan exerted his power for many centuries in an effort to blot from the earth God's faithful witness. That's what Daniel described as to, to tread the sanctuary and the host underfoot. Pagans and papists were actuated by the same dragon spirit. So Revelation 12, 9 tells us who the dragon is. Isn't that right? And Revelation 20 and verse 1, or 2, 1 and 2, tells us who the dragon is. It's Satan, that old serpent, the devil. But Great Controversy 438, I may or may not have that quote on this presentation. She says that it also represents, the Bible says that the dragon is represented by kingly authority. Would you like to see those texts? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, but I'll take you there anyway. Ezekiel chapter 29. Ezekiel 29. The dragon is represented as kingly authority. That's why at the end of the world, we can boldly say that the United Nations represents the dragon power. What a statement. Ezekiel 29 and verse 3. Ezekiel 29 and verse 3. The Bible says, Speak and say thus, saith the Lord God. Behold, I am against the Pharaoh. And who is Pharaoh? It says it right there in the text. He's the king of Egypt. Now what does God call him? The great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers. Go to Jeremiah. Chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. We have to establish everything on the Bible, brothers and sisters. And that way, then when you go to your Ellen White CD-ROM and you, and you start pulling out your quotes, you see the harmony. You see that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Amen. Jeremiah 51. Notice what it says in verse number 34. Jeremiah 51, verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. So Nebuchadnezzar, the what? King. king of Babylon. So it's kingly authority, just like Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 51, 34, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. He hath crushed me. He hath made me an empty vessel. He hath swallowed me up like a dragon. dragon. Mm -hmm. The dragon, the beast, false prophet. The dragon power is the kingly authority. The beast power is the apostate woman, the apostate church, Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And the false prophet is apostate Protestantism. Mm -hmm. 
which originates in the United States of America because it pertained in 1842, July, in, in June of 1842, according to volume one of the testimonies, page 21, in June of 1842, the Protestant denominations, primarily in the United States, closed their doors against the first angel's message. They became Babylon in rejecting the first angel's message. Why? 1842? Do you remember the quote, Great Controversy 392? The chart. They preached from the chart, and the doors of the churches. We, we, we're, we're having a, a lot of distractions anyway, so I'm going to just take a moment to distract you, and I'm going to show you this quotation. James White, Present Truth, April 1850. Maybe the Lord don't want you to see it. Maybe you're going to have to take my word for it. Let's try one more. I do not usually do this. I know that it's not the best for recording. Here it is. Here it is. In June of 1842, there was a close of probation on the Protestant denomination. October 22nd, there was a close of probation for the Millerite Adventists. Do you, hear, do you see what I'm saying? But based on the prophetic mirror, and that God now is going to mirror that in a mirror, if this is the mirror and I'm standing closest, you're going to see me first in the reflection. And then you will see what's behind me. So if 1844 is the mirror, then you're going to see Adventists first. Are you getting my, what I'm saying? At the Sunday Law, Adventist probation closes. Then the other denominations, probation closes when Michael stands. They get more time. It was in June of 1842, it was because they preached from the chart mm -hmm. that probation closed. In our day, it's when we preach from the chart that's going to mark the close of probation. Mm -hmm. You don't think the daily's a test question? You don't think the chart is a test question? You don't think the foundations, you don't think it's showing you Jesus? Jesus saying, look, maybe, it's not a, uh, maybe it's not showing us Jesus, but it'll show us how to not have Jesus. If you get my point. Of course it's showing us Jesus. Is the third angel's message a warning against the false Sabbath? Yes. Is it? Yes. But in the proclamation of a warning against the false Sabbath, isn't it exalting the true Sabbath? Yes. Likewise. Likewise. In showing you what the daily really is, it's showing you what the true gospel message is. If we have a true understanding of the way Satan has worked in the past, because he's a counterfeit. You who participated in the first angel's message and felt its power and glory and saw its effects on the people. Just go back with me to the camp meetings, conferences and other meetings where the time 1843 was proclaimed from the chart. Amen. With what solemnity, zeal, and holy confidence the servants of the Lord proclaim the time. The most spiritual and devoted in all the churches caught the flame. And many, like many of us today, who have been trained to worship their church and worship their minister, here learn to fear God alone and give glory to him. Amen. When they preach from the church. This message weaned us from the world. Anybody want to be weaned from the world? 
the preaching of the chart weans us. It's given by the hand of Jesus. You say, well, just give me Jesus. I don't want to hear all that doctrinal. Sister White said, it's the rock of ages. Amen. This message weaned us from the world and led us to the feet of Jesus. To seek forgiveness of all our sins and free and a free and full salvation through the blood of Christ. The first message was to the churches. But soon their religious papers refused to publish it and the doors of their houses of worship were closed against it. Sister White says that that was in June of 1842. Why? Because that chart had come into existence in 1842. In this way, they shut out the everlasting good news. Of the coming kingdom. And when that was accomplished, Jesus and the Spirit of truth left them forever. Mm. And the churches are, or Babylon fell. Wow. Somebody said that it was a shut door. Mm. The dragon, the beast, the false prophet. The daily is the dragon power. The dragon power, each one of those has a political and religious aspect. The dragon power is the kings of the earth. The, the religious aspect is spiritualism. So Sister White calls it. Roman Catholicism, symbolized by the beast, has a political aspect. It's more of a monarchy, dictatorship, ruled by one man's authority. You might say, well, if you like that stuff, you know, the conspiracy stuff, you say it's the black pope, that's fine. It doesn't take away from, the, the, the point is still the same. One man's authority. The, the false prophet, apostate Protestantism, well, Protestantism, although it becomes apostate Protestantism, is the religious aspect. The political aspect is republicanism. Represented by the two horns on the lamb in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. At the end of time, they no longer will represent Protestantism and Republicanism. They will represent military might and economic prowess. We see that represented in Daniel 11 and verse 40. I'm so glad you're recording all this because we're not going to absorb it all. Maybe you can see the DVD. It was the chariots and horses and many ships of Clovis and those other pagan Roman kingdoms that were taken away by, by giving their power seat and great authority to the papacy that caused the papacy to rise to prominence in 538. At the end of time, when the papacy is resurrected and the deadly wound is healed, it will be the military economic strength and the, and the uh, uh, economic support of the United States of America. And we saw that recorded in the history of 1989 to 1991 when the Soviet Union crumbled and collapsed and Time Magazine records on its cover that how Reagan and the Pope conspired to hasten the demise of communism mm -hmm. and the Cold War ended. The Cold War ended because of the economic and military power that backed up the paper. Remember Sister White said verses Daniel 11, 30 to 36 is a pattern for Daniel 11, 40 to 45. History has to repeat. America represents the armies of Rome today. This is a quote that brings a lot of clarity. I hope it does for you. Great Controversy, 1888 version. This is the appendix, page 680. And those who maybe wanted to warm up their food, now would be a good time. I've been given the 30-minute signal about five minutes ago. Pardon me. The first persecuting power is represented by the dragon itself. Heathenism, paganism, synonymous term, spiritualism, synonymous. In heathenism, there was an open alliance with Satan, an open defiance of God, right? They worship idols, they worship the sun, they cut their flesh, they sexual ritualistic worship. That's open heathenism. That's the dragon power. The dragon actuates all of them. It's Satan's working. Don't get it mixed up. 
but he uses different devices. And here's an argument for those who say that the third person of the Godhead is Jesus, that it's not the Holy Spirit. You ready for an argument? Mm -hmm. Now now the Lord is just, just bringing some things out now. There is a prophetic argument that shows, because in Isaiah chapter 14, Ignore me. in Isaiah, the 14th chapter, what did Lucifer say he wanted to do? He said, I will be like the most. Now, does God, I'll rephrase it, I'll do it backwards. We are told that Satan has a threefold, Revelation 16, verse 13, it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Mm -hmm. In verse, I want to say 19 of the same chapter, Revelation 16, it says, I saw Babylon divided into three. Mm -hmm. So in time, Babylon is three. The power of Satan to tread down the gospel is three. God uses three angels messages Mm -hmm. to perpetuate the gospel. Mm -hmm. But Satan who uses his power on earth because he's been constrained to the earth. He uses a one, two, three-fold power. Why? Because he wants to be like God, who God is a one, two, three-fold power. Maybe I'm getting a little bit excited. In heathenism, there was open alliance with Satan and open defiance of God. In the second persecuting power, the dragon is masked. Right? Who is that describing Papacy. The papacy. But the spirit of Satan actuates it. The dragon supplies the motive power. In the third persecuting power, all traces of the dragon are absent. This one's an easy one. You don't have to guess. And a lamb-like beast appears. Dragon, beast, false prophet. But who's behind it all? Satan. He wanted to uproot the government in heaven. He caused a communistic uprising in heaven. Satan is a, is a communist. Satan is a communist. He's a socialist. He says, all the angels, we hold all things in common. We're holy. We don't need God's law. We'll make our own government. So he causes a communistic uprising. And why do you think he works through fascism, communism, Nazism in the earth? He uses the same tactics, the same motives. And a lamb-like beast appears, but when it speaks, it's dragging. You know, I know, I know God wants us to hear this message. And I know the devil is fighting against this message today. It's, the, it's dragon voice betrays the satanic power concealed under a fair exterior and shows it to be of the same family as the two preceding powers. In all the opposition to Christ and his pure religion, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. In all the opposition... To Christ and his pure religion, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, the God of this world, is the moving power. Earthly persecuting powers are simply instruments in his hands. Mm -hmm. The dragon is said to be Satan. Here's the statement I've referred to several times. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. And we don't need Sister White to even say that. We saw it in Ezekiel 29, 3 and Isaiah 51, 34. We have two Bible texts that show a king on earth being called the dragon. Now she comes and gives a third witness. Two abominations. Jesus told us to study the daily. Matthew 24. Amen. Matthew 24. Verse 15. We're going to wrap this up. Matthew 24 and verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, Jesus tells us, I remember when I first came into the church, just, you know, several years back. And I hear ministers say, you know, because, you know, that's our message. Daniel Revelation. That's our message, right? I mean, the whole Bible. We're the people of the book. Amen. But Daniel and Revelation in particular, God's people have a special understanding. He raised up Miller and his associates. And we are an offspring of that original foundational movement. Those are, those are the books that God has given us an understanding in prophetically. And ministers, I often hear them say, 
Daniel said, uh, uh, Jesus said, study Daniel. And amen. It gets you kind of excited, right? But what, he did, what, what he's really saying in particular is study the abomination of desolation. Mm -hmm. And when we go to, let's see what, Jesus is referring us to Daniel, right? Mm -hmm. And he's referring us to the abomination of desolation in Daniel. So let's go to Daniel chapter 9 and see Jesus, uh, uh, Daniel speak about the abomination. Daniel 9, and, and follow me now because this is, we're, we're giving you this as Bible argument, Bible evidence. Daniel 9, Jesus, because what did Jesus say? He said, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Don't go there. You go to Daniel 9. I'm going to read Luke 21 to you. Jesus puts it this way. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is not. So when do we see in the book of Daniel? Because God, Jesus has given us the book, the reference to find the truth about the abomination of desolation. He says, go to Daniel. So we go to Daniel. And where do we see in the book of Daniel where the armies of Rome surround Jerusalem? We see it in Daniel 9, 26. It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's 70 A.D. And the end thereof shall be with a what? Flood. And unto the end of the war. What is the next word? Is it singular or plural? plural? Two abominations. Two desolating powers. See, so the pioneers were not basing their argument on the spirit of prophecy. Lich and, 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 and Miller, they were writing that before Ellen White came into prophetic office. They were basing it on what Jesus said. And they went to the book of Daniel and they found, they said, wait a minute, there's two desolations. That way, when you go to Daniel 8, 13, and it says, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? Lich said they're linked together by the word and. They're two desolating powers. Not Christ's high priestly ministry. That's the high, look. That's the fulfillment of the plan of redemption. Sister White says in the book, Great Controversy, the chapter facing life's record. She says that the work of atonement only began on Calvary. It's the evangelicals that teach that, that, that it was finished at the cross. We don't believe that. I don't care what the book Questions on Doctrine says. We believe that now he's finishing the work. And that's, the, that's, 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 that's righteous judgment. That's Christ in his highest position. Yet we want to pull him down from heaven and call the daily his work when it's the power of Satan. Two desolations. Notice this. It said, the people of the prince shall come. That's pagan Rome when they destroyed Rome in 70 AD. The end thereof, though, of this controversy with Rome is going to be with the flood. What does the flood represent? Hold Daniel 9 and go to Revelation 12. Go to Revelation 12. Let's begin reading in verse 14. Matter of fact, we will begin in verse 12. Revelation 12. In verse 12, the Bible says this. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a what? Time. And what else? Times and what else? A half a time. Verse 6 says that the woman went into the wilderness for 1,203 score days. So the time, time and a half is 1,260 days. A day equals a year in Bible prophecy. This is Miller's eighth rule of interpretation. The same plan we should be following now at the end of time. Amen. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a what? The time, times and a half is also called the flood that the dragon spewed out of his mouth to try and get the woman. For 1,260 years, papal oppression and supremacy reigned in the old world. But what happens? Go back to Daniel 9. Let's read these quotes, and we're going to go. We're going to close right there in Daniel 9. Notice this. Two desolating powers, two abominations. 
This is a quote. This is from P. Gerard Dam Stieg's book, page 21, Foundations of the Seventh-day Adventist Message and Mission. William Miller, when applying his hermeneutic, who remembers what hermeneutic means? Method of Bible interpretation. Noticed in the various apocalyptic passages a reoccurring theme of controversy between the people of God and their enemies. In his analysis of the persecuting powers of God's people throughout the ages, he developed the concept of the two abominations defined as paganism, the first abomination, or the daily, and the papacy, the second abomination, representing the persecuting power within the church. Mm -hmm. It was the motif of the two abominations that characterized most of his following prophetic interpretations. Mm -hmm. So the 2300, the 25, the 2520, the 2520 breaks down peg daily and abomination of desolation like, to, in my mind, than any, clearer than any of those other prophecies. Because when you divide 2520 in half, you get 1260 and 1260. So you have 1260 years of daily pagan supremacy, and then you have 1260 years of pa papal supremacy. Motif, that's a big, I didn't know what that meant. So I looked it up, so I said, maybe the people of God won't know what it means. Because he... Miller based the majority of his prophetic understanding and his hermeneutic on the two abominations motif, daily, abomination of desolation. A motif means a main element. Wow, do you mean that Miller's main element of studying the Bible was based on the daily and the abomination of desolation? Yet at the end of time, either we have the wrong view or we say, don't talk about the daily, it's not a test. It is an idea, a feature, a main theme, or subject to be elaborated on, a repeated figure or design. That's the New World Dictionary, because I couldn't find it in the 1828. I had to call my son this morning, and he had to give me the definition. I, I, I'm too pressed for time. Two abominations. Jesus declared to the listening disciples the judgments that were to fall upon apostate Israel, and especially the retributive vengeance that would come upon them for their rejection and crucifixion of the Messiah. Unmistakable signs would precede the awful climax. The dread, dreaded hour would come suddenly and swiftly, and the Savior warned his followers, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. If you ask an Adventist today, if they have a view, if they even have a view, and you say, what's the abomination of desolation? They'll say the papacy, and you know what? That is correct. But how do we reconcile this statement? Watch. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up on holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning sign should be seen, those who would escape must make no delay. Which... Those pages should tell you what chapter that is in the Great Controversy. It's very early in the book. Which chapter? First chapter, the destruction of Jerusalem. When did the destruction of Jerusalem take place? 70 AD. So she said that the, when Christ said the abomination of desolation would stand in the holy place, she said that the Romans would come in, seven, in 66 with Cestius, plant the Roman standard, some furlongs outside the church walls, or the, or the, or the walls of the city. That was the abomination of desolation. But wait, I thought it was the papacy. Two desolating powers. The daily. I know I'm wearing you out. I know I'm wearing you out, so we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. Andrews, notice what he says. Paganism, down to the period when it became so far modified that it took the name of popery. I know you like that statement, brother. It says, paganism down to the period when it became so far modified that it, be, it took the name of popery had been the daily desolation. This is Andrews, by which Satan had stood up against the cause of Jehovah. And it is in the light of these facts that we are able to understand our Lord's reference to the abomination of desolation. It is evident that there he cites Daniel 9, 26 and 27. It's not, Jesus wasn't telling us to study the, uh, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't referring only to the papacy. He was referring to pagan Rome and papal Rome. He was referring to the daily and the abomination that maketh desolate. Mm -hmm. 
But at the end of time, we say the daily shouldn't be a test question. Yet our Savior thought it so important that he said, look, if you want to know when it's time to flee, study that thing. It was shown on Daniel 8, 13, and I know we're getting restless. We're really closing. I, 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 we're really closing this time. Sacrifice is a word erroneously supplied. We've seen Litch say it. We've seen Ellen White say it. And I believe this is Smith. We'll get to the reference in a moment. Sacrifice is a word erroneously supplied. It should, it should be desolation. It should say daily desolation. That is a more appropriate interpretation of what Daniel was telling us. He made it a noun. He made it, he made it the, 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 the genuine article. He did not modify anything else with it. He didn't try to modify the word sacrifice by saying daily. He wanted it to stand alone because he was pointing us to the fact that Satan daily treads down the gospel. And the, that expression denotes a desolating power of which the abomination of desolation is but a counterpart. It's, it's, it's becoming clear to me as I see these things. And to which it succeeds in point of time. The daily desolation was paganism. The abomination of desolation is the papacy. But it may be asked how this can be the papacy since Christ spoke of it in connection with the destruction of Jerusalem. And the answer is Christ evidently referred to the ninth of Daniel, which is, predict is the prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem. And to this verse of chapter 11, which, de which does not refer to that event, Daniel in the ninth chapter speaks of desolations and abominations, plural, more than one abomination, therefore treads down the church. That is, so far as the church is concerned, both paganism and the papacy are abominations. But as distinguished from each other, the language is restricted. And one is the daily. It's not Christ's ministry in the sanctuary. It's an abomination. And the other is preeminently the transgression or abomination of desolation. Final, let's go back to Daniel 9. Let's close this. Let, let, let's, let's put the, the Bible stamp on it. Daniel 9. Once again, verses 20. We've been referred by, 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 by Sister White. We've been referred by Jesus. Let, let's, let's make that clear, clear. Matthew 24, verse 15. We've been told by Jesus, study those abominations of desolation in the book of Daniel. Andrew says he's referring to Daniel 9, 26 and 27. Smith said he's referring to Daniel 9, 26 and 27. In there, the word desolations is plural. It said that the people of the prince would come and destroy the city. That's pagan Rome destroying Jerusalem in 70 AD. But then it says a flood came and we went to Revelation 12 and we showed how the flood is a parallel of the, of the 1,260 years of the papal abomination. But how do we, what ended the... What ended the 1260? Someone give me an answer. What ended the 1260? History fulfills prophecy. That was Miller's 13th rule of interpretation. And we are to follow the fall of the papacy. Say that louder. The deadly wound, right? The deadly wound. Daniel 9, 26. It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, pagan Rome, shall come and destroy the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be when the papacy with the flood comes to persecute the church. And unto the end of that war, that period of two, well, I'm, I'm going to say this, that period of 2,520 years. You'll get it after when you see the video. And unto the end of that war of the 2520, desolations are what? So what ended the war? Desolations are what? Determined. What ended the flood? This determined. What does the word determined mean in the original language? It means to cut, sharpen, decide, decree, determine, maim, be decisive, be mutilated, to wound. What ended the flood? The deadly wound. Two abominations. It's not Christ's high priestly ministry. It's not because I say it. It's not because I believe it. It's Amen. because the Bible has declared it. Amen. It is a salvational issue. Why? Because when the Millerites preach from the chart, they preach the foundational message that Christ gave to his people to bring about the last movement. Guess what? We're supposed to be a part of that movement. 
many of us have stopped moving. And so God gives the prescription, the healing balm. She said nothing should be allowed to come in and disturb the foundations which were established in 1842, 43, 44. Mm-hmm. Does that mean country living is not part of the third angel's message? No, it does not. Does that mean the health message is not relevant? No, it does not. Does that mean dress reform is not relevant? No, it does not. Those are all. In- does that mean the message of 1888 righteousness by faith is not part of the third angel's message? First selected message is 372 says that it is that message in verity. But as we see these abominations and these desolations and we see the working of Satan in the world and we know that he's going to bring the final crisis to the people of God. It is to have that effect on us to want us to cry. Why would I want Christ's righteousness if I didn't see the condition of myself and of the events that are going to transpire? As I see Jesus said, my word is the lamp and light that guides your path. I love you. I love you. I'm not going to leave you to tread in darkness. So I've given you the more sure word of prophecy. It is as a light that shineth unto a dark place. You'll do well to take heed. And guess what the result will be if you take heed? The day star will arise in your heart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'm moved by how impressive your truth is, how exceeding broad, yet how simple. You've given us the pattern. It is when we stray from the foundations that divergent views, wild ideas, Paul said it this way. He said, the Spirit speaketh this expressly, that in the last days, many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Peter said that damnable heresies would come in amongst us at the end of time. Satan is working on the right hand and on the left, but we know that the blood of Christ pleads much more powerful than any of his arguments. And we know that he has given us a truth by which we can be sealed intellectually and spiritually, having the new covenant promise fulfilled in our very lives and experience. As we understand, as we eat the little book, and as it becomes sweet in our mouth, even though it's associated with that bitter experience, as we eat it, we partake of the new covenant promise to be sealed intellectually and spiritually, having your law written in our hearts and minds so that we cannot be moved. I pray for everyone here. Lord, I'm thankful. I certainly pray and hope that this would move us to personal study. Herein lies the connection. In personal study, that we would go back and that we would test. The evidence has been plainly presented. Nevertheless, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But we cannot be rightly persuaded by the creeds and opinions and the traditions of others. Lord, I pray that we would allow the line of the tribe of Judah to unseal the book to our understanding personally and that we would take up the work individually to be students of prophecy and experience that personal intimate revival and reformation that the message is designed to bring us. Breathe your blessing upon us, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.